Welcome everybody, Day Drinking with David. Very, very excited to be uh, seeing Mr. Steven Soderbergh with his wonderful Singani Muscat Brandy coming on today. Uh, it's still very smoky in LA. I'm sure, sure the Bay Area isn't doing much better, but at least we've got some delicious Muscat Brandy to drink. Uh, it's a good day drink, it's a good, daytime drink. It's a nice nighttime drink. It's an easy drinking thing here. Let's see if Steven is up and raring to go. Uh, 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 uh. Here we go. Up. Unable to join. So it goes. Uh, mm -mm. And let's see. Let's see. Mr. Soderbergh. Here we go. We may have to get you connected to the Wi-Fi if you're only on the uh, the old uh, the old uh, cellular network. It won't go through that way. But uh, let's see if we can get it going here. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Singani, ready to roll. Okay, I think we're coming right up. Oh no. wow! Hello. Does that work? Steven, what a pleasure. You are, I am underdressed. You are. Let me get our audio going. There we go. Hello, sir. How are you? Are you taking over Bolivia finally? Well, virtually. Virtually. That's the, yeah. that's the only way there is these days. I know. Great to see you, man. It's been a really long time. It has. Well, it was yeah. like, when was it? it? Was when we had that sort of dinner thing? You know, I think. It was at the premiere of Magic Mike XXL, oh, okay. yeah. a fine film. My wife's I, one of my wife's favorites. I think in in these troubled times, everybody <laughs> would do well to revisit XXL. Yeah, it, yeah, and the original it, too. The whole line. It's just absolutely. Lovely. It's great to see you, man. How is life? Are you well? Well, I'm hoping to go back to work uh, very soon. Um, like a lot of people, um, you know, work got disrupted. And no kidding. I, I, my wife and I stayed in New York the whole time. So we've been here wow. throughout. So it's been uh, really interesting watching the city go through various phases. Yeah, you guys were right in the shit, as they say. Yeah. I mean, now California's... A burning pile of shit but um so i'm kind of jealous of good old new york now nowadays but uh, well you know what they're trying to do apropos of what we're going to talk about is in uh, two months ago they opened you know sidewalk uh dining and drinking and that seems to have gone well there have been mm -hmm. no spikes or anything from that but i think what i look at and and worry about is it's beautiful outside right now. What happens when it starts getting cold? You know, yeah. th these these accounts are trying to trying to soldier right. through somehow. Yeah. yeah, it's it's crazy. I don't know. I I, I mean, th we're gonna have to find a solution of some. I mean, if, if all the restaurants in New York have to close because it's below freezing out, I mean, someone's got to do something. The government's got to step in, or there's no way. That's a huge part of the economy. Anyway, if we had a government, that would be cool. Um, and it, anyway, let's talk about Singani. That's a sure. funner to topic. Yes. Tell us where, when, how, wh how did you stumble on this incredible product? Well, what's shocking to me is how easily it could not have happened. Um, mm -hmm. I was given a bottle of Singani as a gift um, at the start of production party for the Che films in the summer of 2007. This would have been in Madrid. And our Bolivian casting director, Rodrigo Bayot, um, presented me with this bottle at the, at the party. And he told me later that he'd been very concerned about what kind of gift to give me. Why he was giving me a gift at all, I don't know. <laughs> But he thought about it a lot and, and decided sort of at the last minute that he wanted me to have a bottle of Singani because of what, of what it meant to him as a mm. Bolivian 
and its legacy there that goes back multiple centuries. And so the problem was for him at that time, Singani was not being exported outside of Bolivia. So he had to go to this area in Madrid that had a, a, a fairly significant Bolivian population and buy a bottle on the black market to bring to me. So he brings me this bottle at the party and I go, okay, this is interesting. Well, how do you drink it? And he said, well, I drink it on the rock straight. And I said, well, let's crack it open and, and let's try it. And I had one of those instantaneous moments of absolute connection. You know, I was a vodka drinker. I would drink vodka on the rocks. And this, this was more floral, you know, on the nose before you even drank it. Um, very active on the palate. And then the big thing for me was I was used to this, what I call the second swallow. You know, when you drink something of a high proof straight, you've got to be prepared for the second swallow. That's just kind of the deal. And this thing just vanished. Like it just completely disappeared once you swallowed it. So I had two, I had two drinks really quickly. And <laughs> then I went over and found Rodrigo and kind of grabbed him and said, okay, wait a minute, tell me again what this is. Like, where did it come from? What's the, and he, he kind of gave me, you know, 10 minutes on how it's made, what the provenance of, you know, the grape is, uh, the, the company Casa Real that made the bottle that I was drinking. Mm. And so that was all interesting to me. And, and then my immediate concern was, well, can we get a mule train going for the five and a half months of shooting so that I can keep drinking Singani. Keep so we figured out how to keep uh, myself, the camera department and the editorial <laughs> department uh, supplied for the five and a half months. And then we ended in Bolivia. We finished the shoot in Bolivia. And that was when the idea of maybe becoming the importer uh, came up because I wanted to be able to get it in the US, like selfishly, I really thought, well, this should be available outside of Bolivia. Like why, it's like this secret that's been locked um, inside the borders of Bolivia for hundreds of years, let's take it out. Well, and to say that the, the, the category was obscure is an understatement. I mean, I, I've been doing selling spirits for years and when you brought it to us, it was the first I'd heard of Singani. And, and of course, you know, I, I'm like out there looking for new shit all the time. But uh, it, it, it does fall in and next to, you know, some of the other South, South, South American brandy uh, spirits, uh, uh, grape-based spirits, of course, um, similarly so. But did you end up going and visiting the production? Like, can you tell us a little bit how, how what, 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 what a hacienda there or whoever is making it? I, I mean, I can't imagine the vineyards, what they look like. What's, what's, what's it feel like when you're in the place where this is made? Well, it really, it really is, you know, hyper terroir. Like we are, so you're in the Southern Andes in Bolivia in this one sort of 20,000 acre area that's about 6,000 feet above sea level. Wow. This is a terrible place to grow anything. And, <laughs> and in fact, when they started 100 years ago um, to industrialize the production of Singani, they had to really figure out how to alter the terrain to be able to irrigate it for these grapes to even be able to grow. So as you know, it's a single grape, the Muscat of Alexandria grape. It has to be this one grape. Um, and it's, as I said, because it's such a difficult place to grow anything, the grape really has to struggle. Like the, the temperature extremes from evening to daytime are, are really intense. And so the grape grows a very thick skin. And as it turns out, that's where a lot of these aromatics are being trapped. 
Mm. And what Casa Real is doing that I think is interesting as opposed to some of the other Singani producers is they're using copper pot still technology. These are stills that were made in Cognac, France that they've brought to Bolivia. And so the approach is almost that of, of an O to V in terms of how they, they are approaching, you know, creating Singani. And I think that results in a sort of softer profile. Mm. So they distill it twice. Um, and then they use local, you know, stream water from the mountains to rest it in steel for nine months and bring it to proof. Um, it's a very, the whole process is really designed to bring out the absolute essence of this grape. Mm. Like they do no, they don't add anything. They're just really trying to, to pull out that core. And, uh, you know, in my case, I thought obviously they, they did a really good job. Yeah, well, we agree with that. And uh, that would, that would be distinct from the other producers in that maybe the others are using column stills or trying to rectify further or... Uh, That's I mean, my understanding is yeah. that everybody else is using steel, column stills. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, again, as you said, there's... It's a new thing in trying to describe to people this, this narrative that they haven't heard before. Singani on paper reads like some other spirit, spirits from that region. But the, but the specific production process and the result are, are very different than what you would anticipate if you just read about it on paper. Yeah, it's and not so, just Pisco. Yeah, exactly. People go like, oh, it's like a Pisco. And you go, well, no, actually it's not. Um, but that was part of the challenge when we came to market is, is having to educate people on something they just never heard of. I mean, when we came, we, we started in New York and one of the first people we approached was Jim Meehan at PDT mm -hmm. here in New York and he hadn't heard of it. So this, is, this was an obscure brand, but it had a story, it had a legacy, um, it's good juice and you know, I have a big mouth. So I was, <laughs> I was like, I, you know, I felt I talked to some people that I knew that were that were in this industry and and they said, look, you do have you have the elements that you need to sort of bring something to market. I go, the, the real difficulty here is nobody's heard of this. You're starting from scratch and the education process is going to be is going to be hard. Yeah. Yeah. Not to mention uh, the logistic hurdles. I mean, just getting the name Singani as a as a phrase on the bottle I, I i heard the stories of the ttb just totally losing their minds on it and all the issues and of course you, i mean you had originally as you said selfishly wanted to bring it in just for consumption yeah. when did you sort of have that epiphany like if i'm gonna do this like let's let's really do it. like if you're gonna waste the time and money to bring it in so you can drink it like why might as well share it with the people w what was that what was that like? I mean, who, how well, you I think out? the moment, you know, it was all it was all kind of abstract until the 250 cases showed up in a warehouse in New Jersey. <laughs> and you know what I mean? Like you're yeah. you're you're applying for the license to become the importer. And then, you know, you're you're sort of doing all the logistical stuff. But when when physically you're you're, you're sitting on the product in a warehouse, <laughs> you know, now you've really got to get serious about it. And so that was, that was the moment of really determining, am I, am I really going to try and do this? And I think honestly, if, if I'd known then what I know now about what's involved, uh, it would have, it would have been a much more complicated thought process. Um, because I, you know, I, I was, to, I was told like, well, this is what you have to do. Like, this is how it works. And not knowing anything about the spirits industry, but, but knowing coming from a business that is about telling stories and, and every brand has a story. 
And so I felt like, well, I understand narrative, so I'm just going to really focus on that. And I think there's a good narrative here. And honestly, you know, as somebody who considered themselves a professional drinker, I really felt like this was an exceptional product or, yeah. or I wouldn't have done it. Like if, yeah, yeah. if I didn't think other people would have the reaction that I had, I wouldn't have done it. Yeah, no, I get that. And, and, and that's the crucial thing. You know, there's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of brands out there, a lot of junk. And just having some someone's name that you recognize on there does not equate success or quality by by any means. Um, and you, you know, there those are those are things that come in varying degrees. But the number one thing uh, to get people interested in something is to have a, a, a great product. And that's yeah. you know the, the the product itself will speak. You can you can screw up the label and the marketing, but if the stuff inside is something people want, they're gonna buy it again because that's what counts. Uh, speaking of which, I want some. I'm gonna just go ahead. Well, and I'm, all, I'm, I'm way ahead. Have a go with it. You're way I've ahead. Been, of me. I've been drinking ever since my newsfeed told me that Cardi B and Offset are like splitting up. Come on. No, that just broke today. I've been. I had to hit. I had to. I had to put some on a big rock uh, because this is. That's serious. This, That's serious. This is, wow. This is big news. Um, we all know. Marriage is not for the faint of heart. You have to be a grown up. <laughs> and and when you add the entertainment industry on top of it, you yeah, know, it's, it's not simple. This, but it was literally at the top of my newsfeed uh, as soon as the story broke. So that should tell you about what I'm looking at on my phone. <laughs> really, really important stuff. I guarantee you everything else on your phone is is much, much worse it's not I, pretty I, out there these days you have you are famously um you have a famously successful hollywood marriage uh how's how is your beautiful wife doing she's great thank you we've been here we stayed here the whole time in new york so it's been a it's been uh really surreal watching the city go through these various phases and the good news is that we're we're you know two months in basically to opening up you know sidewalk dining and drinking as I said before. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing I want to mention for anybody that's watching is a lot of the a lot of the places that you and I like to go, which are independently owned uh, bars and restaurants, didn't get a lot of this stimulus money in the bills that were passed. The, the big chains got a lot of it and, and they really suffered and are still suffering. So there is a, there is a piece of legislation uh, that's you know, supposedly in session now to target specifically independent bars and restaurants. So for anybody wow. that's watching us, if you go to saverestaurants.com, it will a it'll show you it'll describe to you what the bill is supposed to do it will also show you what congressperson you should reach out to where you are to let them know you really want to see this thing happen because mm. if if this doesn't happen there was an article i read yesterday um that said they think if this if this new bill doesn't go through focusing on independent bars and restaurants that potentially 85 percent of them could close ah i mean that's that's a that's a crazy that's a you're wherever you live is not the same now yeah no if that that's, if that happens like it's i don't that's incredible devastation so i i hope people will support trying to get this legislation pushed through well, and the, you know, there are a lot of industry, you know, we're, I'm lucky on the on the retail side, because we're taking so much of that business yeah. um, that, that was lost to the restaurants. And, um, you know, it doesn't feel good. But uh, it's great that people are still drinking for for, you know, for my family. Um, right. But I'd much rather people go out and enjoy themselves uh, when they can. And um, I don't think people realize how difficult it is to keep a restaurant going particularly when you don't have that bar rest that bar business even if you're doing takeout and now oh the city says you can sell, sell a cocktail here and there it's not like having people saddle up to the bar and drink on a saturday no. night where you're actually paying the rent and paying your mortgage i mean the bills and 
you know, it's, it's, it's nuts. I mean, so I, I honestly, that I can't believe this hasn't happened yet because, you know, if, if all we have left are corporate chain restaurants, it's, we're never going to go. I mean, I'm never going to go out again. It's a disaster. No, um, it's in cultural terms. It would, it would really be awful. Yeah. And as you know, you know, as we, we've been in the market, it'll be seven years in January. Hmm. I, I, we have, we as a brand, I mean, we're small, there's only a handful of us, but we have so many good friends that own and operate their own bars and restaurants. Yes. And, th and I mean, this is, they've invested everything. Yeah. It, it, and it's, it's really heartbreaking to watch them try to navigate this and figure it out. And they, they absolutely need the help. So I'm hoping people will, you know, vocalize um, and, yeah. and make this happen because it's, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, New York of all places, like it's, it's, it's personality will, will be diminished if, if these places aren't able to survive. Yeah, no, absolutely. So it's a, uh, it's a pretty harrowing situation. Well, I'll keep mentioning that, uh, what was it? Save, save, save restaurants.com. Save yep. restaurants.com. Really Super easy to remember. Um, yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. And, and tell, talk us a, a little bit about how, how the restaurant and bar industry has, you know, who are notoriously uh, curmudgeonly on new spirits, how, how, how have they responded to, um, you know, bringing a whole new category behind the bar? Are you seeing, uh, seeing bartenders really adopt it or are they, are they skeptical sometimes? What's the, what's the response? We've been really lucky. I mean, in the sense that um, the the response from the beginning has been very positive. We we went after, we sought out, you know, mm -hmm. the best of the best when it comes to the world of mixology, so that we could find out. We need, we wanted somebody to like give us real talk about. Okay, so what do we have? Like, what do you think of this? And what we what we really discovered from that was the the whole versatility aspect of Singani that we hadn't really considered because nobody that's working on the brand is a bartender. So what we started to hear was people saying, yeah, you know, I've been playing around with it. I'm taking it this way. I'm taking it that way. It's very friendly, you know, with other spirits and with all kinds of flavor profiles. So we we started thinking, well, maybe this is the narrative that we should be, you know, putting out there that that it's incredibly versatile, that you can essentially, you know, create a one bottle bar with mm -hmm. a bottle of Singani. And that's we had a lot of people tell us, like, no, you shouldn't do that. That's too complicated. Like mm -hmm. if you're going to if you're going to come into market with a new brand, you should have one drink that you tell people like, this is the classic Singani drink. And we really resisted that. Like we really felt like that was selling the Singani short somehow. So we've, we've really followed through on this more complicated, but we think ultimately more, more interesting story point, which mm -hmm. is, this is an incredibly mixable spirit. Like it really plays well with others. You can use it either as a replacement for a base spirit in a classic cocktail, or you can, you can blend it with another base spirit. And it just seems to, it, it has no ego. Like yeah. it just, it just seems Blaze. to find its place. Like if it needs to like be in the corner playing tambourine, like, that's what it does. Like it's a very sort of friendly, approachable spirit. Well, and to that, to that end, I mean, you see, of course, people always point to tequila and say, look, the margarita made this thing. But I would point to Pisco and be like, the Pisco Sour has held Pisco back. You know, yeah, it's a right. great way to introduce it. But what do you do then? You know, right. it's, it's- People think that's all you do with it. Exactly, there's no- yeah culture built around, I mean, there's no culture built around sipping it straight. I mean, which is, right. like, you know, that's the easiest way. If you can have a product that someone can, that's 
one great thing about what tequila and and singani of course is that you can just pop it throw it in yeah. a glass drink it ice cube whatever and it's it's fun uh but you know pisco there's a, there is a culture of drinking it straight down there there's a culture of drinking it with food there's a culture of you know these are these these things and and when you when you simplify it to oh yeah yeah pisco sour it's a great drink i'm not gonna yeah, hit on the pisco absolutely. sour. yeah and you'll make a decent sour with singani no doubt yep. um but you do you simplify it and you also lose so much of 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 the romance of the of the potential there um so i that's one thing i i've always i hated about pisco and you know i've I, I know there are other cocktails that are made there and then they just get forgotten. So um, it's, it's such a fun product and uh, we're so, so very happy to be selling it here. Well, you guys, you from day one have been incredibly supportive and, you know, when I, <laughs> I've always thought of K and L in this, like I've had an extra connection to it because um there's some filmmaker, writer filmmakers that I've worked with, Brian Koppelman and David Levine, multiple times. And they are referred to constantly as K&L. So <laughs> when, when we started this relationship, there was, there was always, for me, already going in, there was the, like this really sort of warm uh, association with K&L. And uh, that's continued. So thank you for that. Oh, man, it's our pleasure. And, you know, I said, uh, you know, the product is so important. That's that's what we're always looking for. But the only thing more important than the product are the people. And yeah. uh, you, you know, we're so blessed to have you out here and selling this product for, for us with us. Um, because, you know, you, you, it, it shows every time we talk about it, you're like, you're a true believer. And, uh, and, and that's, uh, that's a, a very rare thing in this business. So uh, I applaud. Well, that was Dan Aykroyd, you know, when I sat down with Dan before we came to market to talk to him about Crystal Head and how that all worked, he could not have been more clear that if you're not willing to show up, like if you're not willing to really be the, the, the front man for this brand and, and go and tell your story anywhere, anywhere anybody asks you to come and tell your story, he goes, you have to say yes. And he goes, if you're not willing to do that, then don't do it. He goes, because you, you'll have no hope. He goes, I, I love my brands. I travel. I go every, you know, he, he goes, I do everything possible that I'm asked to do to support my brand because I believe in it. And, and I really took that to heart. Like, and, and as you know, excellent advice. This, this business, even more than the one that I'm in, is so personal. Like it really is about these one-on-one -on -one relationships you have with the people that are out there trying, you know, supporting your brand. Like you have well, to go out. When you meet one bartender and connect and that connection translates into thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands yeah. over the year of further connections. And it's, it, there, there are very, very few uh, industries so personal uh, I think yeah. that's incredibly astute uh, um, uh, observation. Um, well, I, I, I mean, I'd love to sit and talk about uh, Singani for hours, but uh, I'm just going to go drink, and you should too. Yeah, and me we, too. Let's go have fun, and uh, we miss you over here. We'll hope to see you and have a dinner or do something again very, very soon. It's, I'm it's... hoping to be out there. We're, we're, we're planning to be out there at the end of the year, so hopefully um, – Yeah, we should – to have Things. decent weather, maybe we can do something outside. All that would be fantastic. And, and Singani, and it it uh, it would be our great pleasure. Great. Well, thank you again for your support. It's it's meant a lot to us, and you know, hopefully, soon we'll have this category situation uh, sorted out, and we'll have we'll have our own lane that we drive in. And so, instead of telling people when they ask like, well, what's it like? You know, we'll be able to say, well, it's not like anything. That's why they gave us this category. Like yeah. that's our, oh, yeah. that's our hope. So we're getting close. Well, I, I need an excuse to go to Bolivia, by the way. So uh, as soon as let you me know, visit them, I'm down. Um, lovely. Cheers. Yes.
Cheers. Uh, is, there, is there a word in Bolivian, like cheers in Bolivian or? Just it, salud. No. Salud, of yeah, course. Absolutely. Salud. So, General? Great to see you. Great to see you. Okay. Be well, stay safe. Thank you. Cheers.